The subcommittee will come to order. The Subcommittee on Border, Maritime, and Global Counterterrorism is meeting today to receive testimony on human trafficking recent trends. The chair now recognizes, oh, uh, that's wrong. The chair recognizes that the ranking member of the committee uh, will be late this morning, but he has asked us to go forward with this uh, hearing. So good morning. And uh, we have a great panel in front of us today. Thank you all for being here. I want to especially thank Lieutenant Marsh for making the cross-country trip from my home district in Orange County, California, to provide his expert testimony on this issue. The purpose of this hearing is to gain a better understanding of how we can combat human trafficking worldwide and within our borders, and how we can provide assistance and support to victims of human trafficking. This hearing is timely given that March is International Women's Month and more than 80% of all trafficked people are women or girls. This issue is close to my heart and as many of you know, I've been a vocal advocate to stop and to combat human trafficking. Several years ago, I worked with the Department of Justice and local law enforcement in California to support the creation of an Orange County counter trafficking task force which is who uh, Lieutenant Marsh is representing today. Furthermore, this weekend I'll be hosting a forum on human trafficking in my district, and I'm sure that the issues discussed in this hearing will be of great interest, at least to my constituents back home. Last week, we held a hearing regarding drug trafficking and violence along the United States and Mexico border. But one issue that was not addressed in that hearing was the human trafficking issue which has become a leading source of income for organized crime syndicates that are inciting this violence along the border. In fact, frequently, the same routes that are used to traffic illegal, illegal drugs are also used to traffic humans for sex and labor exploitation. Given that fact, I would be interested to hear from Mr. Kibble on the procedures that are in place to provide assistance to traffic people who find themselves within the United States borders. As the representative of the largest Vietnamese population outside of Vietnam, I have been very concerned about the fact that much of human trafficking victims originate in Asia. And I'm looking forward to learning more about what is being done globally by Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, and how that impacts us here locally and on the U.S. borders. And I believe one important step was the creation of the multi-agency human smuggling and trafficking center that facilitates cooperation between the elements of the Department of Homeland Security of State and Justice. And I'm pleased with the cooperation between federal agencies on this issue. I want to hear more about the role of local task forces and non-governmental organizations in the work of human smuggling and trafficking center. I look forward to hearing your testimony and engaging in an active dialogue. And I uh, now yield to the chairman of the full committee for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman, and I appreciate the uh, hearing being called on this most important subject, and I welcome our panel of witnesses. Uh, human trafficking poses a serious threat to human rights worldwide, with an estimated 2 million to 4 million victims each year. About 17,500 of these individuals are trafficked to the United States annually. Most of the victims are women, children, and individuals from vulnerable populations who are preyed upon by traffickers. Human trafficking jeopardizes the welfare of its victims, but it also poses a threat to our homeland security. The same transnational organizations that traffic in people may also traffic narcotics or weapons across our borders. Some of these same routes used to traffic persons into the U.S. may be used to smuggle terrorists or their weapons into the country. Proceeds from trafficking also could be utilized for other illicit activities that threaten our security. Therefore, for both humanitarian and security reasons, it is imperative that we do everything possible to combat trafficking. This is why the Committee on Homeland Security included provisions in implementing the 9-11 Commission Recommendations Act of 2007 to threaten the capabilities of the Human Smuggling and Trafficking Center. I look forward, Madam Chair, to this hearing 
uh, from today's witnesses whether issues related to coordination, staffing, funding, and information sharing among federal agencies is involved in combating human trafficking, whether or not it's improved. I'm also interested to hear what more needs to be done to ensure we are fighting this terrible problem as effectively as possible. The fight against human trafficking is one we must win for the sake of its victims and for America's homeland security. Thank you. I thank the uh, full chairman and thank you so much for attending our hearing today, Mr. Chairman. I truly, really appreciate it. Other members of the subcommittee are reminded that under the committee rules, opening statements may be submitted for the record. And so I welcome our panel of witnesses. Our first witness, uh, Mr. Kibble, is Deputy Director of U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement's Office of Investigations. That's a mouthful. And in that capacity, he serves as the Chief Operating Officer for the largest investigative arm of the Department of Homeland Security. He is also responsible for policy planning, management, and operations aimed at countering transnational, national security, and public safety threats arising from illicit travel, trade, and finance. Mr. Kibble began his federal law enforcement career as a special agent with the United States Customs Service in Los Angeles, California. Welcome again. Yeah, I think you were before us last week, so we keep you busy. Our second witness, Lieutenant Derek Marsh, has served on the Westminster Police Department for more than 21 years. He became involved with the Orange County Human Trafficking Task Force over five years ago while serving as Westminster's Detective Bureau Commander. Lieutenant Marsh is currently co-director of the task force, which works with a variety of public, corporate, and faith-based organizations on projects relating to abolishing human trafficking in the region. And of course, as someone from my own area, thank you so much for being here, uh, Lieutenant. Our third witness, Ms. Anastasia Brown, is the director of refugee programs at the Department of Migration and Refugee Services of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. Her responsibilities include supervision of all services to refugees, victims of trafficking, and unaccompanied alien minors resettled through the Catholic network in the United States. Ms. Brown has over 15 years of experience with refugee settlement. Welcome. And without objection, your full written statements will be submitted for the record. And I would ask each of you to summarize those statements. Of course, each of you will get five minutes or less. So we'll start with Mr. Kibble. Chairwoman Sanchez, uh, Chairman Thompson, distinguished members of the subcommittee, on behalf of Secretary Napolitano and Acting Assistant Secretary Torres, thank you for the opportunity to discuss ICE's efforts to combat human trafficking. It's an honor to appear before you, before you today to discuss our comprehensive approach in targeting traffickers who exploit men, women, and children, a form of modern-day slavery. ICE has a leadership role in investigating human trafficking crimes and bringing perpetrators of these human rights abuses to justice. ICE uses our cross-border authorities to investigate criminal organizations on multiple fronts, and in doing so, is able to disrupt and dismantle those organizations. The most critical piece of legislation supporting our efforts in fighting human trafficking is the Trafficking Victims Protection Act of 2000, or TVPA, and its subsequent reauthorizations. ICE pursues victim-centered trafficking investigations according to the tenets of prevention, protection, and prosecution, also known as the three Ps. The United Nations reports that human trafficking is a worldwide, multi-billion dollar per year business committed by organized criminal syndicates, individuals, and informal networks that seek to profit by exploiting others. Men, women, and children are trafficked into forced labor and commercial sexual exploitation throughout the world. Many of these victims are lured from their homes with promises of employment. Instead, they are forced or coerced into involuntary servitude, migrant farming, sweatshops, and other exploitive labor in addition to the commercial sex industry. Indeed, trafficking takes on countless and many hidden forms of exploitation in today's society. ICE makes every effort to not only find and rescue victims, but to target and cripple the financial infrastructure that permits human tra trafficking organizations to thrive. Let me highlight some of ICE's investigative efforts in combating human trafficking. During the last fiscal year, ICE initiated 432 human trafficking investigations, an increase of over 24% from the previous fiscal year. 
These investigations included 262 cases of alleged sexual exploitation and 170 cases of suspected labor exploitation. During that same period, our efforts resulted in 189 arrests, 126 indictments, and 126 convictions related to human trafficking. In May of 2007, for example, ICE agents in Newark, New Jersey received information that a married couple was forcing young African women to work in hair braiding salons in the Newark area. Agents learned that the couple smuggled young women from Togo into the U.S. on fraudulently gained diversity immigrant visas. Some of the victims were held for more than five years. Our Newark office ultimately arrested the couple and their son for alien smuggling and harboring, which led to the rescue of 20 trafficking victims. And in January of this year, a superseding indictment charged the defendants with a variety of violations, including forced labor and transportation of a minor across state lines with the intent to engage in criminal sexual activity. One defendant in this case has already pleaded guilty and was recently sentenced. Given the international scope of human trafficking, ICE has an established global reach that has allowed us to foster strong international relationships through over 50 attache offices located throughout the world. These offices allow us to address the global scope of a trafficking investigation, extending from source countries where the trafficking originates, uh, through the transit countries, and concluding in the destination countries. In addition to our global investigations, ICE leads the intelligence gathering and sharing effort through the directorship of the Human Smuggling and Trafficking Center, or the HSTC. The HSTC serves as a fusion center for intelligence, law enforcement, and other information to enhance coordination and communication within DHS agencies, along with other U.S. government agencies in combating human traffickers. Human trafficking cases require law enforcement agencies to be victim-oriented. We in law enforcement have a responsibility to treat victims fairly, with compassion and with attention to their needs. Towards that end, ICE has trained and deployed 350 victim witness coordinators who work closely with HHS, NGOs, and others in the provision of services for rescued victims. ICE and CIS are the principal agencies charged with providing immigration relief to victims of trafficking. We provide a short-term immigration relief known as continued presence, while CIS adjudicates applications for non-immigrant T visas and U visas as well. Continued presence, or the award of T visas, allows HHS to certify victims so that they can access federal benefits. To raise awareness regarding trafficking, in May of 2008, ICE launched a billboard campaign entitled In Plain Sight. The trafficking awareness postings were displayed on highway billboards, subway platforms, in buses and bus shelters, uh, and dioramas in 10 major U.S. cities. We remain committed to uh, combating those engaged in, tra in trafficking victims. We thank you once again for the opportunity to appear before you today, and I am deeply appreciative for your support and would be pleased to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Kibble. I'll now ask Lieutenant Marsh to summarize his statements in five minutes or less. And again, welcome. Thank you, Congresswoman Sanchez and Honorable Committee for having me appear on behalf of the Orange County Human Trafficking Task Force and the Westminster Police Department to present our local law enforcement perspective. In my written testimony, I addressed four areas that impact or could potentially impact local attempts to proactively pursue anti-trafficking efforts. These areas include the dialogues and attempts to legalize prostitution. Law enforcement agencies are stretched thin with budget cuts these days. Well-meaning but myopic attempts to benefit from prostitution will prove to be a great detriment and involve state and local governments in the sexual exploitation of adults and minors. Enacting such laws would add to the workload of law enforcement, social services, health care agencies, all while potentially creating a government advocacy for an industry associated with criminal enterprises and the sexual exploitation of adults and minors. The second issue I discussed was dealt with enacting the federal model for anti-trafficking. Currently, the bifurcated funding stream for federally supporting these task forces can potentially distract from local efforts. Dual funding sources result in dual reporting requirements and open the door for potential duplication of data or complete loss of data. Dual funding sources artificially separate task forces, which are, at their best, interrelated community and law enforcement partnerships developed in their local context to, to enact the federal anti-trafficking model. A single funding stream model, as afforded in federal earmarks, may provide greater support of the federal model of human trafficking, support the interconnected, locally diverse task forces, and allow for more direct accountability with regards to funds expended, 
and data collected and reported. The third issue I discussed was holding the users and enablers of slavery services accountable. Historically, the users of sexually exploited persons or Johns have not been held criminally accountable to the same level as the pimp or trafficker. For instance, in California, it's a misdemeanor to solicit a prostitute. The situation is made even more complex in that Johns have information about brothels and massage parlors that law enforcement would not normally be aware of without debriefing them for their intelligence. Nonetheless, legal consideration of the John, not as a solicitor, but as a conspirator, appears to be supported in the anti-trafficking human research and best practices. In California law, this would allow for Johns to receive equal punishments to the traffickers themselves. While this discussion is at its infancy, I hope we can develop a unilateral strategy, at least at the state level, to deter, if not eliminate, the demand side of this trafficking equation. And the fourth issue I discussed, I brought, when I came up two years ago, I discussed it as well, deals with the severe definition of human trafficking. We continue to find many cases involving victims receiving and apparently possessing money for their services. This practice is an inspired one by the traffickers, as the money helped muddy the water as to whether the victim is being trafficked or is a willing prostitute. This practice is a subtle form of coercion and fraud. Coercion in the sense of giving the victim the impression he or she is earning something, which in turn mitigates the egregious loss of freedoms and choices. Fraud in this sense, the money is essentially colored paper or electronic effluvium, as the vast majority of our victims do not have the option of even spending their money. All the while, the trafficker holds onto the victim's documents and controls their movements, but is not even held accountable for this aspect of human trafficking, i.e. document servitude. Recently, we've had two cases that reflect this, one based out of LA, which ended up resulting in a human trafficking, uh, we attempted to uh, prosecute for human trafficking. Instead, it ended up being pipping and pandering. The issue there was that the people had documents taken from them. It did not appear until they were arrested. But when, in the end, it was not considered to have jury appeal because of the money that some of the women purportedly had. In the second case, was a local case out of Westminster dealing with massage parlors. Women from Singapore were met at the airport, their documents taken. They were given drugs to mitigate their sexual exploitation, as well as being controlled in their movements by the traffickers. This was a, a given some federal prosecution on a human related, trafficking related statute. It was not the human trafficking prosecution we had hoped for. In the end, for victims, closure results from any type of trafficking conviction. However, I think the, strat the strategy managed to undercut the effective documentation of actual levels of trafficking in the United States, as well as victim identifications and federal certifications. I would like to thank the administrator of our task force, Senator Morgan, for her help with developing this testimony. In addition, I would also like to thank Sergeant Tom Finley for his feedback and efforts for this testimony. He has been the cornerstone of our investigative successes. And thank you all again for having me here, and I'm prepared to answer any questions. Thank you, Lieutenant. And now we'll hear from Ms. Brown for five minutes or less. Um, thank you, Chairman, Chairwoman Sanchez, for inviting me to testify today. And I would also like to thank Ranking Member Mark Soder and the other members of the subcommittee for their leadership on this issue. The written testimony of the agency outlines broader recommendations. Um, I will focus my oral remarks on special issues around child victims. As you know, human trafficking is a horrific crime that destroys many lives. It is estimated that as many as 17,500 human beings are trafficked into the U.S. each year to work in the sex trade or as slave labor. The State Department estimates that one-third of these are children, and yet there have been just a handful of children identified in our country since the year 2000. Our country needs to improve its record in the treatment of these most vulnerable victims. Through a contract with the Department of Health and Human Services, my agency oversees and provides services to trafficking victims throughout the nation. Since April of 2006, we've served 1,272 survivors, of which 691 are female adult victims and 29 are child trafficking victims. Madam Chairwoman, the victims we serve have a high range of physical, emotional, and psychological needs. They have experienced severe trauma, often require long-term mental and physical health care services. Children in particular have been severely emotionally and psychologically damaged from their experiences. 
I would like to express appreciation for the recent passage of the William Wilberforce Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act of 2008. And I would like to point out several provisions of the legislation which we feel will better protect child victims, provided that the executive branch faithfully implements the law in a manner consistent with the intent of Congress. First, the legislation requires that as soon as a potential child trafficking victim is identified, they be referred to the Department of Health and Human Services for interim assistance prior to the determination that the crime of trafficking has taken place. This provision so will serve a serious gap in services to children. Immediate safety and long-term stability are the overwhelming needs of child trafficking victims regardless of age, background, type of enslavement, or any other characteristic. Until now, this has been sadly lacking for child victims. There currently exists a memorandum of understanding between DHS and HHS that requires the support of federal law enforcement before a letter of eligibility for benefits is issued. And we have found that it can take an average of six months for DHS to sign off on eligibility decisions for ongoing services. The new law explicitly states that HHS has the authority to make child victims eligible for benefits regardless of whether they cooperate with law enforcement. We ask the subcommittee to reaffirm this point with DHS so that children receive immediate assistance. The key to accessing these interim benefits, of course, depends upon the identification of possible victims and referral to HHS. The law requires that DHS conduct screenings of children from contiguous countries, predominantly from Mexico, to ascertain whether they are possibly trafficking victims. We strongly believe that DHS should enlist child welfare experts to make that determination. Children who have been trafficked are highly unlikely to be willing to speak with law enforcement about their experiences. In fact, they often withdraw in the face of such authority. We recommend that non-governmental organizations partner with DHS to carry out these screenings. We are pleased that Section 235E of the new law requires DHS to provide specialized training for federal law enforcement personnel on identifying victims and referring them for services. In October of 2006, I accompanied members of the Bishop's Committee of Migration to our southwestern border and northern Mexico. And during this trip, the bishops found that there is a high risk that child trafficking victims might be returned for their, to their home country without effective screening. We encourage the subcommittee to require DHS to outline how they intend to comply with this requirement and to include recommendations from NGOs in the creation of these trainings. Additional recommendations from our written testimony include that the committee should use its oversight to ensure functions that DHS transfer the custody of potential child victims to Department of Homeland Secure, Department of Home and Homeland Service, Human Services within 48 hours of apprehension, that DHS not delay the process by which HHS makes these determinations about eligibility of trafficking victims, that DHS provide assistance to Homeland to Health and Human Services in their new responsibility relating to unaccompanied alien children's access to special immigrant juvenile status. We have also recommended longer service periods for victims of trafficking, better coordination among federal agencies, that the federal government should provide more education and guidance to federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies, and that more funding should be available to victims. In conclusion, the federal government has made great strides in addressing human trafficking since the year 2000, but much more needs to be done. Working together, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops strongly believe that we can drastically reduce, if not eliminate, this horrific crime against humanity, and we look forward to working with you and all members of Congress until this goal is achieved. Thank you for this opportunity, and we'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Brown. And in conjunction with the rules of the committee, each of our members will have five minutes to ask a series of questions. Um, I will begin by asking my questions of the panel. Uh, Mr. Kibble, how important is it that states or localities enact anti-trafficking legislation? Um, does the lack of such legislation in some localities affect any investigative efforts that you have? And how do you think that the federal government uh, should get states and local agencies? What types of incentives could we uh, give them in order for them to 
take a look at this issue. Chairwoman Sanchez, uh, of course, those decisions are for state and local governments, but certainly ICE would welcome any, any tools, any actions that leverage more resources to bear uh, on this critical problem. Uh, the, the partnerships in approaching this particular threat of human trafficking rely heavily on our first responders and uh, on including NGOs, including uh, public safety personnel. And any, any emphasis, legislation, or tools that would help to leverage and, and, and concentrate those resources on human trafficking and get us to colla co collaborate more aggressively would be welcomed. With respect to incentives, I, th I think it's just, my sense is, is that we tend to be more effective uh, the, the more we can co-locate. So any uh, tools that allow us to, to bring people together, I mean, for example, uh, reimbursable positions. Uh, we have, for example, a model of, a, of the Human Trafficking Task Force down in South Florida, uh, where Homestead Police Department is the grantee, but we've got within that task force co-located full-time 15 ICE agents that are also augmented by representatives from Health and Human Services, from the Diplomatic Security Service, from several state and local agencies. And working shoulder to shoulder, we're able to harness all those varying authorities and bring them to bear. So I think any, any mechanisms that can bring us together and to co-locate uh, more and work together uh, in more of a full-time basis is, is the way we need to go. I happen to have run the field office in Orange County and actually worked very closely with Lieutenant Marsh. He exercised heroic leadership in, in trying to marshal people together to try to focus on this crime. And yet, uh, that was always a challenge. I think he would, he would concur in terms of trying to get the folks together and get us shoulder to shoulder focusing on the particular issue. With so many other issues that local enforcement have to do, I mean, get the bad criminals uh, uh, and with all the scarce resources, especially right now and the new issues after 9-11 of worrying about um, people who, who want to hurt us in a terrorist sort of situation. Do you see a, a large knowledge base in local governments with respect to trafficking, or is it so down, far down on the list that it's, you know, they're, they're not even in any sense focusing on it? Is it more located on the western coasts where people may be coming in from other countries more frequently? What, what do you see as the knowledge base at the local level? And do we have to do an outreach to local agencies to make them understand this may be happening right in their own backyard? Uh, absolutely, Chairwoman Sanchez. So the, um, uh, first off, there are varying levels of a knowledge base depending on where you are. But uh, one of the things we've recognized with the finite resources we have is that the more we can raise awareness, public awareness, I mean, there's a paradox here in that this crime occurs in the shadows but by the same token, it's in plain sight. I mean, what, going through the course of our normal responsibilities, if we can sensitize people to what the human trafficking indicators are, uh, they may be more inclined to identify a potential human trafficking situation and refer that so that it can be further investigated. So for example, with respect to raising awareness among uh, our state and local partners, uh, we've had a very aggressive outreach and awareness program where we've provided, uh, we've trained over 12,000 law enforcement officers from uh, more than 1,400 agencies worldwide, not just domestically, but foreign as well, so that we can, again, enlist additional eyes and ears to try to, to uncover this, this, this issue. And Lieutenant Marsh, can you describe the relationship that Orange County Human Trafficking Task Force has with Immigration and Customs Enforcement or the other federal agencies engaged in combating trafficking? Do you have contact with the Human Smuggling and Trafficking Center? And how can that relationship between the federal agencies and the local agencies be better enhanced? Well, Congressman Sanchez, like uh, Mr. Kibble mentioned, uh, we've been working closely with ICE since the inception of the task force and enjoy a very good relationship with them. They've gone with us on surveillances. They've gone with us during our arrests. Uh, it's been a very positive relationship from day one. And as being the federal component to our task force, it also helps with regards to federal prosecutions and preparing the proper documentation, et cetera. We also work closely with the FBI, the Department of Labor, uh, to include them in our efforts, investigatively speaking, to make sure we have the most robust cases we can present. Uh, could it be better? Sure. 
Uh, I think that when you have people in the same room, I think that's probably the ideal situation. What Mr. Kibble referred to in Southern Florida is a model I think that's worked for us with gang enforcement, worked with us for domestic violence, and would also work with, uh, for us with human trafficking. Uh, I think from a federal level, because of the mandate for those agencies, becomes more simple for those agencies to commit people to it. From the local level, like you alluded to earlier, uh, it becomes difficult to get people to get assigned from local police departments to human trafficking because of local agendas. Human trafficking being both hidden and in plain sight doesn't cross the radar of a lot of chiefs of police and, and local politicians. And as such, it's hard to get dedicated full-time personnel committed to those particular efforts. We try, we do the best we can, but I think that raising of awareness you were speaking of earlier is critical to getting these task forces that are actually all sitting in the same room, enforcement, NGO support, social services, even judicial branches, so everyone's on the same page as far as what we have to do w to make it a success. Ms. Brown, let me ask you a question before I pass the baton over to our chairman here. Um, I, I, I have a lot of people saying, you know, we've got a lot of problems. We've got to get attackers, terrorists, people who want to bomb us. Um, why are we spending our time uh, trying to stop this trafficking into our nation? Uh, what would be your answer to that? And secondly, in your testimony, you said that you thought as many as 17,500 people probably trafficked into the U.S. annually, and yet um, there's not a lot of prosecutions going on, and uh, you know, by your own numbers, you help a lot, but it doesn't get anywhere near that number of people that, that are out there. So what, what's the disconnect? What are we, why is it so difficult? Why are we not getting to these 17,500 people? Thank you. On the issue of um, why should we care, these are individuals who have been subjected to the most horrific crimes here in our own nation, and it would be completely irresponsible not to care for these populations. And as was already pointed out, the traffickers are in fact making a great deal of money on this crime. An individual, a gun can be sold once, a drug can be sold once, a person can be sold until they die, and the victim is re-victimized over and over and over again. On the issue of why are there gaps in the number that are estimated by the Department of State and the number that we actually see served, I would say that we have seen improvement. In the past several years, there have been more victims identified. But we, as a country, are still in very early stages in our response and identification. There is need for additional education. We find that where there is a task force operating, often that is where you will see the most victims identified, but that same level of understanding is not throughout the country, and we need to be sure that that education reaches all levels of our law enforcement so that they understand when they have, in fact, come into um, contact with a victim. And um, identification cannot be the job of law enforcement on their own. Training needs to be throughout all levels of society. We are all potentially looking at victims that we do not recognize as such. I now recognize the full chairman of the committee, uh, Mr. Thompson, for his Thank questions. You. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Brown, you made reference in your uh, testimony, uh, your concern about children, and uh, you further talked about the fact that in many times children were returned back without any uh, hearing uh, or whatever. Can you elaborate a little bit on that for me? Um, thank you for that question. On the issue of children being returned, there's an agreement between the United States and Mexico as an example that an unaccompanied child crossing the border would be immediately returned and, and the Border Patrol and, um, and our Department of Homeland Security has tried to protect the children until such time as the return. But 
Unfortunately, there hasn't been a screening for that child to in fact ascertain whether they are a victim of human trafficking. The Border Patrol and our, our federal authorities are very concerned on the issue of the smuggler and are concentrating their efforts, rightly so, on protecting um, victims who are being smuggled, yet the actual victim themselves is not receiving a great deal of screening, in fact, no screening for these children coming across from Mexico. Yet Mexico is one of the highest countries that we see victims served through our trafficking uh, program for adults. Okay, uh, Mr. Kibble, uh, you've heard Ms. Brown's uh, concern. Uh, uh, has the department uh, shared the similar concerns about children in this, who are caught in this human trafficking web? Uh, sir, I, I can't speak to uh, CBP and, and the Border Patrol, but I can tell you within ICE, it, uh, it has certainly been an issue of concern for us to the point where, as I had mentioned during my statement, we've continued to expand training for our victim witness coordinators so that we, when we encounter victims of all types, but, but in particular children as well, uh, during, during the course of an investigation, uh, we have agents that have been specifically trained to focus on taking care of those victims' needs. We've actually brought on, we're in the process of bringing on two full-time staff at headquarters that specialize in dealing with child victims. So we, we continue to build that capacity, having gone from uh, 300 victim witness coordinators uh, a year or so ago up to 350 and continue to, to build that program so that it's actually to our benefit from the standpoint of, of prosecution because the, the better we can take care of the victims uh, the, and stabilize that situation, the more successful we will be ultimately in dismantling the human trafficking networks. So it, it only makes sense. I mean, not just from the standpoint of the human factor in terms of taking care of that, of that child, taking care of that, that uh, or that adult that has been victimized, but also to build the case. Lieutenant Marsh, one of the um, uh, hallmarks of uh, this committee is we've tried to make uh, the whole process of Homeland Security seamless so federal, state, and locals can share information and resources and what have you. Uh, with respect to the, the human uh, smuggling issue, uh, are you satisfied with the level of cooperation uh, involved in this? Do you see some areas uh, that could improve uh, to make your job as well as the, the whole effort to combat this issue uh, more successful? I'd just like to hear from you. Thank you, sir, for the question. Um, we don't deal a lot with human smuggling. That's usually the province of ICE and other federal agencies, predominantly ICE. Uh, those cases that we do get, we forward to ICE almost immediately because of the level of expertise that they have in that area. We find that our information exchanged back and forth is high, and we're very satisfied with it. Could we get more? I'd love to be able to sit down at the ICE computers and find out what's going on, but there are obviously problems with that overall. However, the information we do need to follow through with prosecutions and identify victims and to provide services is more than sufficient at this time. Will the chairman yeah, yield just I, for I know clarification? What you're going to pick up on. Go ahead. You said you didn't deal with human smuggling, that ICE did that. So are you saying that once these people are smuggled into the country and they're actually in your neighborhood, that what you deal with is the actual how they're being used and how you find them? I mean, I'm, I'm trying to see what the delineation was between what you left in Mr. Kibble's court and what you really take on? Well, we, we, take, we will take on the, any crime that occurs against a person who's being exploited. I don't want to say that we're not involved with it, but I would say if you're looking for primary responsibility in a case of smuggling, we would defer to ICE on that level. So if you found a hot house in, in Westminster, let's say, or Garden Grove, where there were people just in transit to be smuggled, um, you know, where they had paid a coyote, let's say, and they'd come across the states and now they were sitting in a home waiting to be dispersed in Nebraska or wherever the jobs supposedly were, you would just call ICE on that. But if you found, what if you found people who were there who were going to be dispersed for um, the sex trade? Would you also call ICE or would you 
when, when do you call ICE and when don't you? What if, what if you find the sex trade actually happening right there in Westminster? I mean, the, the actual actions of, of using women, for example. I understand what you're saying, Congressman. Um, I, I think that I've made a distinction that really doesn't exist in our world, and it's hard for me. To, it's like separating Solomon's baby. Uh, we team so closely with ICE when it comes to investigations. We participate all the way, whether it's smuggling or human trafficking. When we do human trafficking investigations, ICE is with us on surveillances. They're with us when we go in and serve search warrants. They're with us during the course of the, the follow-up investigation as well. If it's human smuggling, we, tr we approach it the same way. Human smuggling and human trafficking usually aren't determined until later on in the investigation. It all looks the same on the face value. And because of that, that's why we team with the federal agencies to make sure that we're covering all of our bases efficiently, as well as with our NGOs to supp supply support for those victims. Because we have to take, we have to assume the worst case scenario that there is human trafficking going on. And if it turns out to be something different, so be it. But again, having what Mr. Kibble mentioned, having that safety and security provided by the social service providers, by our NGOs, is critical to getting the actual information regarding the criminal organizations that do smuggling and do perpetuate human trafficking as well. Thank you, Lieutenant. Thank you, Mr. Thompson, for yielding. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Brown, um, as an NGO um, involved in the process, um, are you duty-bound to uh, keep private some of the information you pick up from some of the victims, or uh, is there a thin line between um, what you pick up and what you share with authorities? Um, client confidentiality is, of course, extremely important. However, in our, um, in our contract, which is a federal contract, certain information is collected, but with removing specific identification of the individual. The individual victim, but you can share information on the smuggler. Um, yes, in our, in our work, we, we would be working with the victim already identified. However, on the local level, they would be working very closely with law enforcement to be sure that the victim, um, that the victim is served, but also that the prosecution goes forward. Mr. Kibble. Sir, if I could just expand on that. Um, on a routine basis, we get referrals from the NGOs on human trafficking matters, uh, the most prominent being the, the, the case I know that's been discussed before this subcommittee in the past, the Corredo family, uh, where they, we uh, uncovered uh, roughly 60 plus victims and then the uh, NGO that we had partnered with also identified 25 additional and we continued to build the investigation and get services to the victims. But they're a critical uh, source of information for us to initiate our human trafficking investigations to the point where we've, as part of our awareness and our outreach, we've trained uh, almost 28,000 people from uh, roughly about 1,200 NGO organizations, again globally, so that we can try to to, to, to demonstrate you know, how we can partner with them to solve this problem. And I, I, even from my days uh, in Orange County, uh, we had such a close partnership with representatives from the NGO in terms of trying to, to do what's right for the victim because it's got to always be centered on the victim, but also to further the investigation so, so we could put away the bad guys. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Chair. I'll now recognize the gentleman from Laredo, Mr. Cuellar, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for having this meeting, and uh, certainly also want to thank the witnesses for being here. Uh, Mr. Kimball, let, let me ask you this question. Uh, ICE Office of in uh, Investigations has a wide array of responsibilities, and I want to follow up what the chairman said a few minutes ago. Uh, you have uh, investigating immigration violations. You have smuggling of narcotics, uh, weapons, people, financial crimes, cyber crimes. Um, where does human trafficking fit in this priority if you had to somehow fit it uh, on a one to 10? And, and I understand there's competing interest. I know there's um, uh, limitation of resources, but on a one to 10, where does it fall? One being the most important one. And, and keep in mind Armas Cruzadas and other things that you mentioned. It's a tough, it's a tough question, Congressman. Uh, 
And I think the way that plays out is when we look at all of the things we do with respect to cross-border crime. On a one to 10, where would it fit? <laughs> I, I really couldn't place it on a number because what happens is, for example, during the course of a human smuggling investigation, where we have significant resources devoted to that, our victim witness coordinators may identify a human trafficking situation. And the moment we identify something that threatens public safety or national security, all the necessary resources are leveraged towards that. Now, I think to get to the intent behind your question, is there more that could be done proactively? I mean, because obviously in a reactive situation, we're going to do everything that's necessary to save that victim. Um, we operate within a finite world of resources. With additional resources, we could do more proactively to uncover, to expand our outreach. I think, though, an important part of this is the partnership, because law enforcement isn't the total solution. So the, mo the more we can partner with the first responders and the NGOs, then we can leverage the unique capabilities we bring to the, to the issue. Well, then let me go back to, to a point that I talked to the chairman about is coordination. You know, there's um, a member of the line of question I asked you last time on the border. Name me how many border sheriffs you have. Name me how many uh, police departments you have. Uh, name me the number of states that have their different plans. Uh, on human trafficking, as an example, you had what the State Department, you have the Department of Justice. Um, how do you coordinate this? Well, let me ask you, is there a, a comprehensive plan out there that coordinates everybody together? Well, certainly uh, through the TVPA, I mean, starting at the very top, you have the, the interagency task force, as you are familiar with, sir, uh, that meets annually. And then you have the SPA, the senior uh, policy operating group that meets quarterly to coordinate our efforts. Uh, across the federal government. And then I think one of the, great ex one of the best mechanisms are the, the DOJ-funded human trafficking task forces, 42 of them now. ICE participates in every one of them. Uh, and those are excellent platforms to bring, to bring the national effort into it, the state and local participation, the NGO participation. Okay. Uh, again, to a ask you the same question, how do you coordinate? I mean, are you coordinating right now? Does, for example, one of the questions you answered a while ago, you said, I, I don't know about the Border Patrol, so that assumed that you're not coordinating in a specific way with different agencies, state, federal, and local. Uh, no, sir, sir, I only meant by that comment. I'm just not familiar with, with their protocols in terms of handling uh, when they encounter child victims. That's the only point. But I if you're make. coordinating, you would know what every agency or even the local folks um, uh, would know. For example, if you ask Lieutenant Marsh, um, if you have this type of situation, does he have a protocol to know who to call or just say, call ICE? I, I know certainly from my time in the, in the Human Trafficking Task Force and my association, we had worked out protocols in terms of how notifications would go out to all of the stakeholders so that they could leverage their unique uh, capabilities. I, if you're asking about a national coordination uh, mechanism or platform such as some sort of fusion center or something like that, I'm not aware of, of anything along those lines, sir. Okay. All right. Well, I, I, again, I appreciate the work that, that you all do. I know it's a tough, but I'm one of this. I've been saying that I've been pushing for coordination um, and the, um, uh, where the feds and the local folks and even the nonprofits also uh, get involved. Uh, because if everybody has their own individual plan, and that even, even if you just take the federal government and then look at what the state and the local folks and the nonprofits, I feel very strongly about having a coordinated effort, a comprehensive coordinated effort where the left hand knows what the right hand is doing, and, uh, and that applies not only horizontally but vertically also. Thank you for, for, for the work that all of you all do. I thank the gentleman. Just wanted to reiterate that the task force in Orange County was set up as a pilot project to take a look at how we could, in fact, include uh, the whole array of agencies and nonprofits and law enforcement, et cetera, that we need, as well as even neighborhood watch groups or people who are trained to sort of look at that. So hopefully, by what we see happening in Orange County, we might be able to develop that across the board. Um, sort of look at this problem. I'll now recognize uh, Mrs. Kirkpatrick for her five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank, thank you to all of our panelists for being here today. I represent a, a huge portion of Arizona, which is, is a border state. 
and Mr. Kibble, you were here last week. We were talking about the drug smuggling. You know, the, the three components of that, the, the money laundering, you know, the smug, drug smuggling, and then the arms smuggling across the border. And now you're here today to talk about human trafficking. Do you think the same organizations that are involved uh, in this drug, tr drug trade, uh, the, those cartels in Mexico, are the same ones that are doing the human trafficking? Do you see a connection there? I, uh, Congresswoman, from the standpoint that uh, the drug cartels control access corridors into the U.S., um, they, of course, have, they influence all of those illicit flows, guns, money, drugs, and people. Uh, what we have seen are, uh, as was referenced earlier during the hearing, some of the same routes, some of the ha same human smuggling organizations may be used to introduce trafficking victims into the U.S., and that can play out in several different ways. In some instances, people may voluntarily contract with a human smuggling organization to come into the U.S. to find work and then un uh, discover that they've unwittingly placed themselves in a human trafficking situation that now involves force, fraud, or coercion. So from that standpoint, we do see some crossover. I mean, it's one of the advantages, I think, to uh, having the broad portfolio that we do because we're not just focused on one particular commodity. We look at the full spectrum of what we may find with respect to an organization and try to attack every aspect of it. Mm -hmm. It makes particular, again, I, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to be victim-centered and really focus on the victim. And it's why we have uh, taken that so seriously and expanded our Victim Witness Coordinator Program because you do, you, you, I would hate to hear that we had approached a human smuggling investigation and because we hadn't thought about some of the other human trafficking indicators, we in, in, a, in essence wound up re-victimizing someone that had been submitted to force, fraud, or coercion. So it, we take it so seriously and really are trying to look at all aspects of cross-border crime that may be involved. Thank you. I'm, I'm sure that there, I mean, there's so much fear and, and apprehension that it's very difficult initially to get accurate information. Uh, so I appreciate the work that you're doing uh, with, your, with your victims. Uh, again, Mr. Kibble, you know, <laughs> Phoenix is the second highest kidnapping rate in the, in the world, and I wondered if you feel that the human trafficking is a significant cause of that. G generally speaking, um, from what I've been told by our special agent in charge in, in, in uh, Arizona, is that from the standpoint of the cross-border aspect, it, it, the kidnappings tend to, tend to uh, focus more on rival smuggling organizations uh, ripping off each other's human cargo. Uh, as we've tightened the border, the value of that, of that human cargo has gone up. And uh, they're essentially trying to cut out the logistics associated with actually smuggling them across the border and, and unfortunately, sadly, steal the human cargo from a rival organization and then try to even then extort more money from the relatives to secure their release. Uh, and then the other aspect of that, of course, is the drug-related kidnappings where uh, rival drug organizations are, are holding each other accountable or stealing each other drug loads, and that accounts for, I, I'm sure, at least more than 50 percent of uh, the kidnappings that we see in, in Arizona. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back my time. Thank the gentlewoman. We have been joined by Mr. Green of Texas, who I know has a few questions for the panel. And as he said to me as he walked in, all day long, he's going to have to be in two places at once. So <laughs> if you figure out how to do that, please let me know oh, how you, you do. Thank you, Madam Chair. You are, you are so gracious and so kind. And I thank the, uh, the witnesses for their testimony as well. I am indeed in financial services right now as we speak. So uh, you see my double here today. But I thank you for the, your testimony again. And I'd like to go right to a couple of things. Uh, perhaps you've already given some explanation, but I believe it bears repeating if you have. Uh, because of the magnitude of this problem and because of the, the heinous crime that it is, what is our budget, our overall budget for dealing with it? And if you've accorded us that, uh, I apologize, but I'd like to get it if I may. Sir, speaking for ICE, we, we don't have a dedicated budget associated with that that breaks out uh, exclusively for human trafficking. We have a broad PPA that uh, within we, which we operate um, to, to deal with cross-border crime more generally. 
um, if, if you're trying to get a sense of the investment of resources uh, from ICE, I would say when you consider we, we, we have the equivalent of roughly 100 folks that, that are working full time on this. When you consider um, even our human smuggling groups that may uncover a human trafficking situation and then start to investigate that aspect of it. When you pull it all together, it's, it's roughly a, a hundred or so agents. Quickly, would it be uh, advantageous to have a line item for this? Would that be helpful? Sir, I, I guess that's... Uh, well, I'm, I, I, it, it would be my decision as a policymaker, yes. and, but what I'm trying to find out is, before I make a policy decision, I need to know whether it's a needed, something is needed. So would it be helpful to have line item monies for this? I can't really comment on the line item, sir, but, but what, I, what would be helpful is we, we, we try, with the, with the resources we have, I mean, really this is about resources, with the resources we have, and we've tried to be as creative and as aggressive as we can in terms of partnering with others, because really, again, as we've been saying it over and over today, so much of the effort involves enlisting the first- My response. time is halfway finished. Let me just ask this then. Would more resources for this problem uh, be of, of benefit to you? Yes, sir. Okay. And uh, now let's move to Mr. Marsh. Uh, uh, sir, um, what is uh, your budget, please? Again, we don't have a specified budget. We are fortunate to be one of the 42 funded task forces federally. And so in that sense, we have a $650,000 budget over three years from the Bureau of Justice Assistance. Uh, but if you're going to follow up with the question, could we use more? Sure. I mean, we would. I would love to have a dedicated task force of people that just did that full time, and that that level of money, while very generous, and we will use it to its maximum, does not afford for that type of everyone in the same room focusing on that problem full time. Would the gentleman yield? For yes, a of course, Madam Chair. Of that six hundred fifty thousand over three years, so that's about two hundred thousand or so. What does that do? I mean, how, who, what are the different components of your task force, and what do you do with that money? In our third iteration, Congresswoman Sanchez, uh, basically we're going to about two-thirds of that will be dedicated to law enforcement, probably part-time civilian investigators, reserve officers, and coordination with our intel unit, which is in our age of criminal enterprise unit, to focus on trafficking, both proactively searching for sexual exploitation and labor trafficking, and the other third of that will go towards training, uh, support for a task force administrator, uh, in this case, Andrew Morgan, who I know you've met in the past, uh, to actually take care of the, of the data, help take care of data collection, running the task force, and helping coordinate law enforcement outreach efforts. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, finally, uh, Ms. Brown, please. The uh, victim services budget is within the Office of Refugee Resettlement and Health and Human Services, and they currently have about 10 million a year for victim services. We believe that this is completely insufficient and would ask for an increase to probably more in the order of 15 million. With regard to our services right now, the limitation on funding has meant that victims only receive services for about four months. Their needs are extreme and we find that the service period is not sufficient, let alone if we have additional child victims identified, which we are hoping will come to, to pass, the services would need to be um, more robust for them. Thank you, uh, my time is up. I thank you, Madam Chair. I can, yes, I do. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and Madam Chair, uh, this question relates to um, my wanting to be of help and possibly offering legislation. Uh, my question is, would, would a, a rewards program be a benefit? And let me quickly tell you what I mean. Uh, we have found that offering, for want of better terminology, a bounty, uh, a reward for persons who do things, who engage in certain activities, uh, has been helpful uh, throughout the ages, this has been helpful. Would a program that has a reward, let's say, of $100,000 for a person who is indicted and convicted of human trafficking, would that help us in two areas, deterrence 
and also an apprehension and conviction. And you can each just tell me yes or no, and uh, that'll give me some ideas of whether I should proceed with my idea. Mr. Kimball. Yes, sir. Based on our experience across other programs where that's been effective, yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Marsh. I agree. It would be helpful. Uh, Ms. Brown. I wouldn't be able to comment on whether that would be helpful. I do know that the victims, when they see justice has been brought against the perpetrators, it is extremely beneficial for them. So anything that would help to make sure that um, the perpetrators are convicted would be helpful. All right. Uh, Madam Chair, with your consent and permission, I'll, I'll move forward, but not until I get it, so I'll talk to you when we have We can have a discussion about that. We'd be interested in what your ideas would be Thank you. to put something forward. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Green. I, I have a couple more questions that I'd like to ask. Um, I, I'd like to begin with Mr. Kibble. With so many trafficking victims estimated to be in the United States, why are there so few prosecutions? Ma'am, um, it's so hard to determine what the baseline is. I know the estimates have ranged anywhere from 14,500 to 17,500 traffic into the U.S. I'm not sure what the methodologies were behind that to, to, to arrive at that baseline for trafficking activity. Um, and and I, I don't really have a, a direct answer for you. I, I, all I can say is that what we've seen is that as we've applied more resources to this problem and more attention and more focus, as you are doing with this hearing today, uh, our, our numbers have gone up. For example, if we were to look at, if we were to assess the victims um, through ICE's issuance of continued presence through the law enforcement parole branch, we've had an 84 percent increase over the previous fiscal year. I had mentioned before during my statement that we had a 24 percent increase in our, in our uh, investigations initiated. So that there's it, certainly, regardless of what the baseline number is, we know that there is more that there's more that needs to be done and that, that more resources and more attention need to constantly be applied to, to this problem. Um, if I and if I could add one other thing, mm -hmm. I mean, this is such a difficult problem, unlike other crim, uh, criminal problems that ICE deals with, for example, because there are disincentives for the victims and others could probably speak to this uh, more eloquently than I. But there may be fear because of cultural uh, uh, biases from their own countries where they're, they're unwilling or fearful of approaching law enforcement officers. Uh, there's the threats that have been leveraged by the traffickers against their families back in the countries from where they originated. All of these things really complicate and challenge uncovering mm -hmm. uh, these crimes. Do you see that clawback as a reality? In other words, I'm trafficked here. You tell me, oh, you know, if you try to leave, if you tell on me, your family's going to be decimated back at home. Do you, do you, is that, I know that's used as a threat. Is that a reality? I, I, I don't, off the top of my head, I don't have a specific situation in mind where someone has actually been hurt. But I can tell you that the threats go beyond just verbal threats in the sense that we've seen cases where the trafficked women's children are held by the traffickers in the source country. Um, yeah, so that, uh, that, of course, is great leverage um, in controlling the victim that is, that's now within the U.S. And do you conduct, how do you conduct outreach directly to those who are, be, who are being held in enslavement of what, for whatever services they're forced to provide? You know, uh, how, how do you get to them? How do you educate them to, you know, run, get out, it will be better? From, uh, what we've tried to do is, 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 again, through this public awareness campaign, we've tried to place, um, b again, billboards. Uh, are there investigations because of the billboard campaign? Actually, uh, Congresswoman, we, we are assessing right now. We, that's a fairly new campaign, and we've actually started implementing uh, program codes so that we can assess how, that is, how effective that has been in terms of our referrals. The challenge we've had is that when we get a call on our tip line, um, we haven't been able to capture whether that call came because someone saw the billboard. We're also approaching the, the NGOs to ask them, um, based on the referrals we've received, whether that came, whether they could query the victims and see whether that came as a result of the exposure that came from, from the billboards in the 10 cities that we had, we've launched that campaign. Ms. Brown, in your work, have you seen where some campaign or some information campaign has actually been found by the victim in order to 
try to come to you or try to come to law enforcement or try to get out of that cycle of enslavement? Um, I would say that the reality is that the campaign is more directed towards the individual who might identify the victim. The victim very rarely understands that there are laws to protect them in the United States. Given where they've come from and what they've been through, they often don't even realize that a crime is being perpetrated against them. They have been told repeatedly that law enforcement is only there to um, return them, that if they are returned, there will be threats against their family. We have, in fact, made contact occasionally with a family member in the country of origin to try to assure them that their family is safe, and that is done through NGO contacts and has been very helpful. But the victim often also uh, is a woman whose child is being held against them in the country they came from or here in the United States. The trafficking trafficker has removed the child from the victim here um, or has stated that their child will be victimized as well. So the, the terrible irony of it is that the victim very rarely understands the laws there to protect them or that they can in fact come forward. The campaigns should be and are more targeted toward the individual who might come into contact with them. And Lieutenant Marsh, do you have anything to add to that or is that your understanding of what you've seen over the years? Our, our efforts from our task force's experience have been more focused towards community awareness and reporting to the national hotline manned by the Polaris Project. We've you know, been very successful with tips on that level we work every single one we have. But I would also say from a victim perspective, I've yet to have one victim say they heard of anything like that between their physical isolation, their cultural isolation, their language isolation, and the reaction, the, the reality is is because they're being so victimized so repeatedly, they're in, in, a, in a, almost like a post-traumatic stress disorder mentality, they're in survival mode. And it, even when we try to help them sometimes, it doesn't work because all they wanna do is get the heck out and go back. And so it, it's very frustrating from a service perspective um, to help them because they are the key to our cases in many instances. And if they don't cooperate, whether it's because they don't want to cooperate or because they're just not mentally in that frame of mind to cooperate, mm -hmm. um, our cases suffer as a result. Mr. Kibble, I know that you have a comment, but I also want to follow, you to follow up on um, what happens to this person who's a victim and how, how are they, are they churned by the process in the sense that, are, or do they get to stay in the U.S., are they sent back? What would be the typical type of situation for someone who would, would be in that situation and would testify against somebody here in the United States? Sure. Uh, Chairwoman Sanchez, there are a number of mechanisms that are available to them. Um, ICE generally relies on an interim immigration relief through the continued presence issued by our law enforcement parole branch. That gives them up to a year of time of status and also uh, documents so that they can they can find employment. Uh, there's also the T visa that's a, and the U visas that are, that are adjudicated by the uh, by CIS that uh, afford them four years and also the opportunity to, to ultimately convert to lawful permanent resident status as well. Um, to go back to the just one other thing I wanted to add during uh, a couple of investigations we've identified a particular vulnerable area in Mexico where we've made plans to actually, in collaboration with others, to go to those communities to sensitize them to how they could be subject to exploitation. Um, and I think that's a model that we're going to adop adopt more and more, particularly with our, our reach, with our international presence around the world, so that as we identify patterns where particular communities are being exploited uh, or lured uh, into trafficking situations, we can try to, to assist with prevention in, in sensitizing them to, to those risks. That was my next question. What are you doing in the countries of origin to stop this? Um, what's the type of cooperation you're getting from these foreign governments? Because, you know, when I think about Vietnam, I mean, most people would say the Vietnam government is in cahoots with trafficking some of these people to other countries. Ma'am, I don't have the, the specifics by country, but generally from what I've been told by our Office of International Affairs, and, and based on, on the types of investigations we've mounted, we've generally gotten uh, good support in terms of exploiting. Obviously, we seek to dismantle the entire scheme, the entire network, and we have received support from, uh, from the countries in which we are in in addressing um, 
in addressing the, 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 the part of the conspiracy that's based in that particular country. But I couldn't speak to, to particular countries, and I'm, and I'm quite sure that that level of support will vary from place to place. You talked about the importance of confiscating traffickers' assets, um, sometimes to compensate victims or to deter other traffickers. How often does that happen? Um, in the, the amounts generally range, well, let me say this. We, we're always looking at the financial component of every investigation we approach, and that includes human trafficking. So, for example, as we identify assets associated with a human trafficking organization, we will take our asset identification removal groups and have them focus on that financial infrastructure so that we can t try to deprive them of those, of those assets. Um, if you were to look in, at the numbers, that tends to range uh, somewhere around anywhere from one to three million during the course of any given fiscal year, just to give you an idea of the activity, the level of activity. My last question, and first I'll give uh, Mrs. Kirkpatrick a chance to ask if you have any other questions to ask of the panel. Thank you, Madam Chair, I do. You know, I just saw a documentary about human trafficking, and one of the video clips was of a five-year-old, looked like she was about five years old, being sold uh, by her mother. So I think that to really, we, we need to go to these vulnerable places and, and educate them on that, because it's being done for economic reasons. and. Uh, later, the little girl was found in a house of prostitution. Uh, they were rounding up these little girls, 12, you know, 13-year-olds taking care of five, six, seven, eight-year-olds. Uh, and, and again, it, I, I thank you for your, for your good work. We last week looked at the good co cooperation that the ICE has with Mexico in terms of fighting the drug cartels. Do you see that same level of cooperation uh, with fighting human trafficking? Indeed, we do. Uh, through the Global Trafficking in Persons program, we actually have vetted units, vetted partners that we can work with to, to pursue the investigation within Mexico as well. Uh, and uh, so that's a combination of joint uh, operational collaboration, but also capacity building where we're providing a lot of best practices and training and so on to, to build up their ability to, to focus on the problem. Thank you. I yield back my time, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. I thank the gentlewoman from Arizona. Uh, to the panel, what can we do to make your job easier? What do you need from us? Is there anything we should do to change the law? Any resources we should put in? Any particular area we should be taking a look at? And I'll start with Ms. Brown. Um, well, I do believe that the recommendations in the testimony do outline um, some of those areas, but certainly the need for greater education and resources to be sure that task forces such as the excellent one in Orange County exist to ensure that um, the victims who are not likely to come forward and necessarily identify themselves to a Department of Homeland Security official have a, an ability to speak and be screened by an NGO. I'm speaking specifically with um, regard to the children at the border who may in fact be a victim of trafficking but will not ever say such a thing to the, um, the Customs and Border Patrol agent who intercepted them. And again, additional funding for victim services and, and compensation for the victim during this process to ensure that in fact the prosecution does have a good witness. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Lieutenant Marsh. Thank you, Congresswoman Sanchez. Uh, I think I spoke to a couple of the issues in my testimony. I, I still believe that um, from a funding perspective, I think the single stream funding streamlines our efforts uh, administratively and focuses us to make sure that we continue to reinforce our interconnectedness and our collaborative style that we've been able to engage in, at least in Orange County. And the task force I've spoken with has the same issues uh, regarding that. I would also say that when it comes to the, I keep harping on the severe definition of trafficking and the law has gone a long way to minimize that and I appreciate it. I think some of the prosecution perspectives lag a little bit behind um, the TVPA. And I think the issue of money when it comes to the traffickers paying a, a, a pittance or just a, 
a little bit to offset and to muddy the waters to potentially be explicitly mentioned in the law to say that it's not an issue, that you can't pay a slave to be a slave. Um, that might help out as far as perspectives go when it comes to building cases and doing prosecutions. And um, finally, if we're gonna have task forces that sit around uh, around the same area, and I don't mean sit around, but are able to collaborate, look face to face, especially from a law enforcement perspective, it's an expensive proposition. And if we were to have greater funding to create such a task force, it not only allows to pay for people full time to participate from the local level, but also sends a message fr from the federal level to the local level that it's an issue of high priority, that if you can have a continued commitment over three years like our federally funded task forces have, but allow for that type of law enforcement collaboration from the federal, state, and local levels, which would include state and federal prosecutors, I think that would send a message across the board about the level of importance. And as Mr. Kibble mentioned earlier, the more resources you put into it, the more victims and the more cases you're gonna get. And that's just the bottom line of that. Mr. Kimball. And, and I would just add that uh, anything that can be done to increase awareness, because you, you, I think of uh, the case of uh, the slavery case in Irvine, where it was, we, the only reason it was uncovered, a 12-year-old girl that was enslaved in a very upscale neighborhood in Irvine, uh, the only reason it was uncovered because of an alert neighbor that noticed that the kid was never sent to school uh, and wasn't allowed to, and never played outside. Uh, it's the more we can get the general public and again the folks that would come in with that would potentially encounter these folks that ask an, a, a few additional questions um, when someone comes to a doctor's office or wh wherever the situation may be the, the more we will uncover these situations because again from from the standpoint of law enforcement because of the very reasons that have been discussed today there, there's not the same willingness on the part of the victim to come to law enforcement because in their own countries they may be victimized uh, in some instances by, by law enforcement. So it's, it's really broadening that awareness to the general public. Thank you, Mr. Kibble. Well, I thank the witnesses for their valuable testimony and of course the members for their questions. And the members of the subcommittee may have additional questions for the witnesses and we would ask you that you respond quickly in writing to those questions. Hearing no further business, the subcommittee stands adjourned.